So welcome everyone. My name is Janice Law. I'm the founder of nine-year-old American Women Writers National Museum. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. And our mission is to honor premier American women writers. Should I be on the screen as well, Janice? You've got the right one on. Okay. <laughs> American women writers, historical and contemporary. For about nine years, we were in rental space at the National Press Club, but now we're on Zoom. As a nonprofit, we appreciate any donations, which can be through PayPal or mail to our PO box, which is on our website. We were so lucky recently as to have C-SPAN 3 air nationally as part of their American History Project, our video on women and early radio. So we're trying to conform our videos to their specifications in hope that they might air more of our programs nationally in the future. Accordingly, would you all accept Speaker Dr. Ford and myself, mute your microphones, I think most of you have. It's very important because any sound other than Speaker Dr. Ford or myself interferes with the video. C-SPAN mentioned that to us. Any questions you have for Dr. Ford may be emailed to her at the same email, email you used to RSVP for this event. So anyone who hasn't muted your mic, please do so. Our speaker today is Dr. Sarah Ford. She's professor of American literature at Baylor University, Waco, Texas, where she also directs the annual Beale Poetry Festival. Dr. Ford is a nationally recognized expert on Eudora Welty, who lived from 1909 to 2001. Ms. Welty won a Pulitzer Prize and was honored with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Dr. Sarah Ford is the author of three books, she holds a BA degree from Baylor and a PhD from Tulane University. Anam is honored to present Dr. Sarah Ford. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. I am happy to be with you here today in our virtual meeting. I want to thank Janice Law for inviting me to speak to the American Women Writers National Museum. I am passionate about the work of Eudora Welty, so I'm always happy to talk about her writing. I wish we could be together today in DC, but I'm grateful for this virtual alternative. I am coming to you today from the campus of Baylor University in Waco, Texas. So um, bring a little bit of Texas to you today. I'm imagining there are some people in my audience today that already know and love Eudora Welty's work very well. I hope to just give you a new angle on her work. Uh, others may not be as familiar with Wealthy, so I hope to entice you to read some of her work. For the benefit of everyone, what I wanted to do was uh, just take a minute here at the beginning and put in front of us a larger picture of, of Wealthy, her life and her work, and then we'll get into my specific topic of Eudora Wealthy's vision. So uh, Janice just talked about Wealthy lived from 1909 to 2001. And if we think about that lifespan, really Welty lived the 20th century. Uh, she published from the time she was 27 years old until she was 75. And so we see in her work really a microcosm of our American literary tradition in this time period. We can see the literary movements of realism and modernism and postmodernism is in her work. So she's very helpfully representative to us of American literature in this time. Her work is also innovative in a number of ways, uh, some of which we'll talk about uh, in a minute. Um, she's innovative in her ability to capture different voices through idiom and dialect, so you feel like you can hear the characters. Uh, she also is known for her evocation of place and character. Um, she's innovative in her rewriting of older genres or myths, something I'm going to touch on later today, and in her focus on the views of female characters. Her work, I should also say, is also very funny. She has a sharp wit. By the end of her life, uh, she had written numerous short stories, two novellas, a short story cycle, three novels, and a memoir. As Janice noticed, she had won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Medal of Freedom and also a National Book Award. Her work is widely taught in high school and college classrooms at this point. Today, I wanna to focus specifically on Eudora Welty's vision. So in interviews, Welty would often say that she had a visual mind. 
when she was asked how a particular story or another one came to be, she would often say that it started with an image in her head, and then she would write the story of that image. Uh, for example, her best known story, A Worn Path. She talked about how this story started as an image. She was out in the country one day with a friend of hers who was painting. So Welty is just sitting in a field while her friend paints. Um, and in what she calls the middle distance between her and the horizon, an elderly African-American woman walks across her vision. And the woman seems very intent on her purpose. And so Welty takes this image of this woman walking in front of her and decides to create the errand she thought the woman might have been on. And so that story started with that image. Our roadmap today, I would like to talk about Eudora Welty's background in photography. I think that her early years practicing photography enabled, enhanced that visual mind that she said that she had. And then we're going to draw two threads out of that photography into her prose. So two ways that photography impact or enhanced her fiction. So let's first talk about her photography. Um, in her biography of Eudora Welty, Suzanne Mars talks about uh, Welty's father and his love of photography. So he helped to establish the first camera store in Jackson, Mississippi, where Welty was from. He used his camera to document his travels, uh, to take pictures of his wife and children. So Welty really got this love of photography from her father. Welty even created her own dark room to develop her own photographs. So she was really interested in the art of photography. Photography became more important to her personal development uh, when she started a job with the WPA. So from 1933 to 1936, Welty was a junior publicity agent for the WPA. And she jokes that junior was because she was a female. But anyway, she was, her job was to travel all through Mississippi and document what was happening during the Great Depression. And so she would go from county to county, writing reports on the condition in that county, uh, paying particularly attention to road conditions, because a lot of the WPA projects were road projects. And she decided to take her camera along. This was a very formative experience for her. Uh, the experience allowed her to see and to document through that camera a larger world. Uh, she had grown up in what she called uh, Mississippi's only city of Jackson. And so being able to travel through all of these counties showed Welty the living conditions during the Depression. She saw the stark poverty in Mississippi. Um, she understood more about farming and the both uh, the necessary nature of farming, but its pr precarious nature as well. Uh, she took a lot of photographs of culture in rural areas. She paid attention to state fairs, to artists such as weavers. Um, a lot of her photographs are of African Americans. She said that up to this point, the African Americans she knew were those that were in domestic labor positions housekeepers, gardeners, seamstresses, and this gave her an awareness, um, an exposure um, to a lot more people and a lot more uh, situations. Welty even thought about being a professional photographer. She loved this so much. She had one photography show early on in New York, um, and when she was first showing her stories to publishers, she imagined a book that would be stories and photographs interspersed. But she had more success publishing fiction, and she decided that prose allowed her to contemplate the inner life of her character. So she became a writer instead of a photographer. Late in life, a, uh, she did publish a collection of those photographs from the 1930s uh, when she had already become a successful writer. And so the photographs we have today of Wealthy come from that collection. I'm gonna show you four today. Our question is, how does this experience, this background in photography, then impact her fiction? So I want to show you a couple of photographs to talk about how pho photography helped her think about visual details as revealing character. So I want to cite my source today. The photographs I'm going to be showing you come from 
the latest collection, the latest edition, I should say, of her photographs is a University Press of Mississippi collection called Eudora Wellsey. has a wonderful forward by Natasha Trethewey, so I would recommend that. So the first photograph I'm going to show you is called Woman from the 1930s, and hopefully you can see my photograph there, um, but I'll also talk about it. So we've got a photograph of a woman, um, and if we think about Welty capturing the visual details to so tell us something about this woman, we have a woman who's standing in a very barren field, perhaps it's winter time, but it's, it's, it's brown, the grass is down, she's standing in front of her clapboard house, her clothing shows that she does not have a lot of money. Um, she's missing some buttons, it's threadbare. And yet her posture also tells us something about her. She's straight back to looking directly into the camera. And so all of these details show us a woman uh, who's very strong, who has um, dignity despite her, her economic uh, situation. Let me show you one more photograph. We'll talk about visual detail. So this is a photograph of a woman shopping on a street in Jackson on a Saturday. She's dressed, uh, dressed up to go shopping. She's carrying a bag. She's just come out of the meat market. We see those details in the background. She's thrown her head to the side. She's smiling with her hat at a tilt. All of these details of this photograph, again, tell us something about this woman, um, her joy in this moment. Uh, Welty captured a lot of moments of people shopping on Saturdays because she said that was the moment when people were probably uh, the most happy. They were dressed up. They were doing something they enjoyed. So let's think about drawing this thread into her fiction that when she says the photography helped her understand how visual details can tell us something about place and character. Let's talk about how we see that in the fiction. I want to start with Welty's uh, comments in her essay, Place on Fiction, on how place, the surrounding, the character's context is often overlooked. She says that when people talk about fiction, they often talk about plot or character and image. They don't often talk about place. She called place the lesser angel. But for her, what a writer is trying to achieve, and this is a quote, is a sense of you and me here. When she talks about how she gets the you, that reader, to the here, what she notes is physical texture. That's how you draw the reader in. Earlier I mentioned that she was noted for evocation of place and character. That's how she draws the reader in, is this physical texture, which is the prose equivalent to those visual details we see in her photography. I've got two examples of that I want to share with you today. Both are descriptions of houses but they tell us something about the character that we are following into that house, or in that house. The first comes from her story, Why I Live at the P.O. So in case you don't know this story, we have a central character named Sister, who's living at home with, with her family when her sister, named Stella Rondo, comes home after being gone for a while, bringing with her her daughter. Our central character, Sister, is a bit miffed that the family seems to be giving all the attention and the favor to Stella Rondo, and they're not curious or they're not asking her what she's been doing while she's gone, how she happens to have a child. Instead, they're just giving her all the favor. Sister feels unnoticed, even though she's been there the whole time and has been working on behalf of the family. So you can think of this as a prodigal son story told from the point of view of the older sibling. So sister decides to leave the post, leave the, the family house and go live in the post office where she works. And over the course of a few pages, we get a list, a very visual list of the items she's going to take with her. So I'm going to read you just a few items off this visual list. Um, and I want us to be thinking about how these details that Welty gives us, almost as if she's giving us photographs, snapshots, tell us something about our character. So here's our list. Sister was taking the electric oscillating fan the family was currently using to keep cool, the pillow she had done the needlework on right off the Davenport from behind Papa Daddy, the flowers, specifically the four o'clock she had planted in the yard, the fern she had watered, the sewing machine motor she'd helped pay the most on to give Mama for Christmas back in 1929, 
a good big calendar with first aid remedies on it, the thermometer, a Hawaiian ukulele, watermelon rind preserves, and every fruit and vegetable she had put up from off the shelves. And on and on this list goes. Obviously, there's a great deal of humor here because the items are so incongruous. I mean, it's not what you would pack to move somewhere. You would be packing your clothes, right? But instead, she packs the sewing machine motor, but not the sewing machine. So, I mean, it's just a hilarious list that tells us um, that our character is a bit silly. But also, this physical texture, these visual details, tell us a lot about Sister. Every item on this list tells us that she is questioning her place in the family. Um, she's questioning what does her labor mean to the family. You know, she's going to take the fruit and vegetables that she preserved and put on the shelves. Are those hers? She's going to take back the gifts she gave to mother of the sewing machine motor. Is that hers? Um, she's going to take the fan and the pillow they're currently using. So. Is it hers because she bought it? Is it, is it the family's because they're using them? Everything that we get here in terms of visual details works together to give us the picture of sister. My second example comes from the novel Delta Wedding. So this is a novel set in 1923. We enter the novel following the character of Laura McRaven. So this is a nine-year-old girl who recently lost her mother and now she's going in the summer to visit her mother's family. She is an only child, but she's going to visit the Fairchilds, and this is a very large family. Over the course of three pages, we, um, click that real quick. Uh, we see Laura's descriptions of the house as she enters, connected to the memories she has of previous visits there. So again, we get a list of visual details I'm going to give you just a little snippet of that list, and we're going to think again about how these details tell us something about our character. Laura remembered the old water cooler on the back porch, among the round and square wooden tables piled high with snap beans, turnip greens, onions. While you drank from the water fountain, your eyes were on the green place in the backyard, the neglected greenhouse, Aunt Ellen's guineas, a wall elbow deep in vine. In the parlor was a clover-shaped footstool covered with rose velvet where Laura would sit. And there were sliding doors to the music room that she could open and shut. In the dining room, there were paintings done by Great Aunt Mashula, who was now dead, paintings of full-blown yellow roses. There were plates around on a rail, all painted differently because painted by different ants. There were numeral packs of playing cards, her cousin India's paper dolls and a shoebox. And when they played hide and seek in the house, there were so many rooms up and down the halls that intersected and turned into dead end porches. And then there were more rooms full of trunks and on and on our description goes. So with these tangible descriptions, the reader is transported to this place, a 1923 house of an affluent white family. We see the affluence with the, the food piled up, overflowing. We can also understand, because we see this through Laura's point of view, how all of these details impact our nine-year-old girl. She obviously loves this place. She remembers all these tiny details. She remembers the clover-shaped um, stool that she gets to sit on. She sort of claims it as hers. And in remembering all of that, we get a sense of how much Laura misses her mother in remembering all of these wonderful details of this house. We also get the sense that is overwhelming to Laura. All the ants that have painted all of these, these different plates. All of the rooms, she almost seems lost in the number of rooms. In fact, at the end of these three pages, Laura vomits. I mean, it's just overwhelming to her. In both of these examples, from Why I Live at the P.O. and Delta Wedding, Welty gives us the prose equivalent of a series of photographs with lots of visual details so that we can be in the here she's trying to get us to, so that we can understand that place and that character better. The second thread I want to draw out of Welty's photographs to her prose is her fascination with the art of observing. She said that the years that she spent um, as a photographer 
fueled her fascination with observing other people and what they were observing. So often when she's taking photographs, we don't have a subject looking directly at the camera. Instead, she takes a photograph of a subject looking at something else. So I've got two examples of that I want to show you here. The first example is another street scene, another Saturday scene of a woman dressed up in a dress and heels. She is observing a store window and we don't get to see in the window what she sees. Instead, we are watching her observe. And we see in her posture there, she's contemplating something, perhaps what she might buy in that store window. And then one of my favorite photographs, uh, this is an image of three women who are watching a state fair. We again don't see their faces. Instead, we are looking at what they are observing. They're observing a double Ferris wheel there. Obviously, there's joy in the scene as they've got their arms around each other. So I want us to think about how um, holding a camera and observing other people fueled Welty's attention to the act of observing. In her fiction, one of the things that I think Welty is just really innovative um, is in her attention to point of view. Who is doing the observing? Whose eyes do we see through? Who's holding a metaphorical camera for us in her fiction? So I want to talk about some ways she experiments with point of view, and I want you to be thinking about how that connects to the camera. One way Welty experiments with point of view is to give voice to characters who don't normally get to tell the story or hold the camera. Um, so Welty does this kind of rewriting of earlier genres. Um, this rewriting becomes very popular in the 1970s and 1980s with uh, writers such as Audrey and Rich and Margaret Atwood. Welty does this a few decades earlier. So one example is in her short story, A Shower of Gold. This is the first short story in her collection, The Golden Apples. And in the story, we get a Zeus-like character in King McLean. So he seems to have powers. He wanders through uh, the countryside impregnating women. He's, uh, he's associated with gold. So he's this kind of Zeus character. He's married to a woman named Snowdy. So she becomes our kind of fairy tale Snow White character. Um, and in one sense, the story is very familiar to us if we've got that mythic background. The way Welty experiments or changes the story is gives a very unusual person the camera, the point of view to see it. We start in A Shower of Gold with Katie Rainey, who's the town gossip who lives at the edge of town. And she starts telling us the story. But even she doesn't know all of the story. A lot of the story she gets is third hand. And the story we are hearing is actually from a character named Plez Morgan, an elderly African-American man in the town who may have his own reasons for telling the story of King McLean a certain way. So Plez tells the story of King coming back to visit Snowdy and getting scared away. Um, King, in Plez's version, runs into his twin sons and is either scared because he does not recognize them, they're wearing Halloween masks at the time, or because he does recognize them and realizes that he has sons and does not want the family obligations. Either way, in Plez's version of the story, our Zeus character is scared away by children. And so we get this sort of comic twist on the story because of who tells it. A second example, I'm going to go back to that story, A Worn Path, to show you a second example. This story is a classic question narrative. We've got a central figure who's going to go through obstacles to get a prize. Here the prize is medicine that's going to cure a young boy or help a young boy, sort of like the Holy Grail at the end. It's a very typical question narrative in that the hero meets obstacles, meets people along the way, but Welty revisions the story by having the central character be a very atypical hero, an elderly African-American woman. We follow her point of view, so it's as if she's holding the camera as we go through the story. We are watching her as she observes things like a white hunter who comes along and threatens her, 
uh, the the two women who work at the medical clinic who demean her when she shows up for the medicine. We see, because we're seeing through Phoenix Jackson's point of view, that her goal is not the typical one of glory, but really love for her grandson. So in rewriting these narratives, but giving the camera to someone else, Welty is making us rethink stories by this different point of view. Another way Welty uses point of view is to try to teach her readers how not to view a story. So she gives the camera to someone and we don't want to see through their eyes. A uh, perfect example of this is her story, Where is the Voice Coming From? So in this story, Welty chose to write from the point of view of the man who murdered Medgar Evers. Welty lived pretty close to the Evers uh, home in Jackson. She was horrified by this event. And she says that when she heard about it, she stayed up all night long and wrote the story, sent it off to the New Yorker, and they are printing it right as Byron de la Beckwith is arrested for murder. So in writing from the point of view of the white supremacist, the reader is forced to see with horror the kind of mindset that would cause someone to commit this crime. Uh, our central character needs to feel powerful. And so he lashes out with violence in order to feel powerful. Along the way, our murderer, who's holding that camera, metaphorically, often uses the second person you to make the reader feel as if he or she is aligned with that point of view. You know, you know how it feels. You understand why I'm doing this. So as a reader, Wealthy is teaching you how not to see this point of view. As a reader, you have to back out of the story. Um, sometimes a, a complicated move for a reader in a story. A similar move happens in her story, Powerhouse. So this is a story inspired by wealthy scene, Fats Waller perform, the blues jazz musician. And her story starts with a narrator at a white dance who's looking at Fats Waller and his band. Um, and this white narrator is very belittling and very racist in the way he describes powerhouse. Again, he uses the second person you to make the reader feel in the here of that story that we are also aligned with that view. Uh, later in the story, Wealthy shifts the point of view, gives the camera to someone else as Powerhouse and his band go to a bar during the break. Um, and we follow them, we get a more sympathetic point of view. So Wealthy forces you basically to choose between these camera angles, choose between the point of view. The last experiment with point of view I want to talk about that I think is impacted by that background in photography is multiplicity. Um, so this is something that, that Welty Gaines is a modernist writer. Other modernists use the same idea of multiplicity. Often Welty gives us not one camera angle on something, but multiple camera angles on something so that we pay attention to the art of observing. Uh, think back to that photograph where we saw the woman looking in the store window. So we're going to watch and see how everybody talks or sees a particular event happening. This happens in the novel Delta Wedding. Uh, various family members tell the same story over and over again. The story is how Laura's uncle, George, saved his niece Maureen from the train tracks. So the family had been walking on the train tracks on the way home from fishing. Maureen gets her foot stuck in the train tracks and George has to pull her off before the train hits her. Eight different family members tell this story during this novel. And each version is impacted by where the story, where the family member was when they saw this event happening, and also how they feel this event impacts the family. So as a reader, when you are reading all of these different versions, uh, you are seeing not just the story over and over again, but how people think about the story, how they tell the story. It's that art of observation we're looking at. The late novel Losing Battles also employs this technique of multiplicity. Uh, for Welty, this was an experiment in externalizing point of view. Uh, she said she wasn't going to get into a, a, a character's interior at all. She does want, she cheats just a little bit. Um, but she imagines this novel as a kind of play where all of the characters are telling their story out loud to the other characters. What we end up getting is lots of different points of view. So in conclusion, 
Welty's early experience as a photographer taught her how to wait for the fleeting moment to capture what a, when a person was revealing himself or herself because of those visual details. It taught her the importance of physical texture, the visual details to building a place, a place in which we can understand a character so that we understand the you and me here. It also taught her the significance of observing, the act of observing. She puts her visual mind to good use in imagining her way into the viewpoints of different characters and bringing the reader along with her. Welty once explained, and I'm gonna directly quote her here, what I do in the writing of any character is try to enter into the mind, heart, and skin of a human being who is not myself. Whether this happens to be a man or a woman, old or young, with skin black or white, the primary challenge lies in making the jump itself. Welty, with a camera lens or with words, makes that jump with her incredible vision. If you are interested in seeing more of her photography, please pick up the University Press book. I want to show you a couple of new books that have come out uh, of Welty's work in case you are interested in reading more. So there's a new edition of her collected stories, has a wonderful introduction by Ann Patchett in it. So that would be uh, one to pick up. There's also hot off the presses, a new version of her memoir, When Martyrs Beginning that has an introduction again by Natasha Trethway. So thanks again to Janice Law and the American Women Writers Museum for reminding me to speak today. I always love talking about Eudora Welty. What about your books? Would you like to show your books? Oh, gosh. I don't have them right here. Oh, you said, what are, what are the titles? Uh, so I will, let, let me just talk about the, the one I've written most recently um, that, that, Wow, you caught me on the spot. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, it's happened to all of us. <laughs> yes. Haunted Property oh. is the one I've written most recently and is about gothic depictions of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, Welty does get a chapter in that book. I, I read Delta Wedding as a gothic novel, um, but really looking at how writers use gothic details to help us understand slavery. I just have one more quickie. Uh, you have two minutes, at least, according to my watch, for the 40-minute time that Zoom imposes. How did you get, briefly, how did you get interested in Eudora Welty? Um, I read her in graduate school, and the first thing I read was actually, I think, the most complicated thing she's read, which is The Golden Apples. I think that's a very complicated book, and I just, I found it beautiful, and I didn't understand it, and I wanted to understand it, so I just kept reading more. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ford, really. It was, uh, your presentation was outstanding. I'm going to submit it to C-SPAN 3 and see if they're interested. And if they're not, of course, it's on YouTube for anyone who didn't make it today. A couple of people have been sending me messages that they couldn't log on somehow. So I think we missed some folks because they couldn't log on. So I'm sorry for my inattention for a moment. I was responding to their emails. So thank you very, very much. Thank you for everyone who attended. We appreciate it. So it'll be on YouTube in probably about a week. And uh, then I'll let you know if it's on uh, C-SPAN 3 or part of the American History Project. So thank you very, very much, Dr. Ford. Thank you. Thank you. See, how do I sign off then, Donna? Down here. Down here. Other. End? Yeah. I guess end. Ending fall.